Okay. So, uh, good evening, everyone. So, I'm glad to have you even for the uh, second lecture. And as we discussed, uh, I mean, uh, over the messages, that the next class is going to be in the morning. Uh, that's going to be your time, I think, uh, between 6 to 7, right? 6 to 7 a.m. So, well, uh, now regarding the law of thoughts, last class, we just had an introductory class. We learned about what is thought. We said that thought is a civil wrong. And then we went into to check the elements of the law of thoughts. Uh, can someone tell me what did you learn during the last class? Just if you can give me a uh, you know, a kind of a brief summary of what we learned during the last class. I'll just give you a hint saying that we studied the introductory part of it. Okay. And we said that law, uh, the, the thought means a civil wrong. So what else did we study during the last class? Can you just give me a gist of it or a summary of it so that we could just proceed further? Uh, this subject is very interesting, but, um, you know, um, we should be able to link one chapter to another and uh, that's how we are going to learn and that's how we are going to, you know, retain it in our minds. So that's the reason I'm asking you this question. Uh, what did we learn during the last class? Any one of you, I'll just not pick on anyone, any one of you can answer me. Or even if two of you want to give, you know, your own like kind of a summary the gist of it it's not a problem what one person doesn't complete the other person can you know complete it anyone come on what we learned during the last class i don't know yeah uh, i'm isa okay uh, i would like to talk about what we have learned in the last class yes uh, please mm. We we learned the definition of a tort, which is a civil wrong. Perfect. Yes. Uh, yeah. Also, we have learned that uh, types of a classification of tort, with intentional tort, negligence, or uh, strict or absolute liability. Perfect. Yes. Also, we have uh, also we have covered uh, elements of tort. Which is tort officer or a person who have committed tort action. Uh, okay. Okay, we also learn uh, act or omission. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Is there someone who would like to add to that? What is they said? He said we learned about the elements of thoughts as thought as well. He said that there has to be an act or an omission. It should be something that is committed. That is, that's what we are calling it as an act, or something that is omitted. Then we said there are different types of thought. Like we have the thought of negligence, we have the thought of nuisance. Nuisance can be public nuisance or private nuisance. We said we have the thought of, uh, you know, strict liability. We've got the thought of um, defamation. The defamation means it could be in the form of a slander or a libel. Slander means where a person talks ill about some other person to the extent that it causes damage to the reputation of another person and libel may be in the in a printed form maybe by newspapers magazines or media and so we spoke about defamation we just went through you know super fast uh, by way of um, introduction saying that there are different types of thoughts uh, so these all all these uh, you know examples come within the ambit of thought then we also spoke about malicious prosecution where a person should not be accused falsely and when a person is accused falsely and the person is you know imprisoned or if it amounts to a fake or a false imprisonment then the person who is falsely imprisoned after he gets out of the case he's got the right to file a case of malicious prosecution under the law of tort and he can claim compensation for that so basically we said law of tort uh, deals with civil wrongs which are not contractual laws 
then we went through certain definitions. And I said that when a question comes on what is taught, you'll have to give me the entire, all those slides, whatever I, we discussed earlier, along with the definitions, that is definitions by prominent people, could be authors or even dictionary, and especially legal definition of taught being a civil wrong. And taught comes from the word tartem, which is a Latin term, which means twisted. Are you understanding? So having said the perspective, uh, yet another thing we discussed before I forget, I said, taught being a, a kind of a civil wrong, it is a civil wrong. So the jurisdiction for a civil wrong is, of course, the civil courts, right? It's a civil court. So it is, it can be handled by the courts or civil jurisdiction. Now, sometimes I said that uh, certain thoughts can have the tinge or a hue or a color like that of a criminal law or any criminal provision. For example, I said rash and negligent driving. Now note here, I mentioned the word negligent. Understand? One of you, I think Issa gave me the definition or rather uh, I asked you, what is the meaning of negligence? And Issa said, I remember, he said that means to be careless. Do you remember? So negligence, so under the thought of negligence, rash and negligence, negligent driving would come as well. Now, rash and negligent driving also comes within the ambit of criminal law. You, you see, it becomes even a police case. I mean, in simple terms. Then we spoke about whether intention is required in tort. Then I remember I just gave you a, you know, a brief uh, kind of, um, you know, a kind of a hint towards criminal law saying that in criminal law, the factor of mens rea is very important. Mens rea, that is criminal intention may be taken into consideration while handling or when a judge adjudicates a criminal case. So sometimes certain thoughts have the hue or the color of criminal law as well. Or rather we put it this way that some thoughts can be, you know, even a criminal offense. Now, in civil law, we call it a wrong. A wrong is committed or there is a breach of law, and so there is a civil case that is filed. Then I said the person who is filing the case is called as the plaintiff, and the person against whom it is filed is called the defendant. They may also be called as a petitioner and a respondent. The person who commits a tort is called dash. Okay, the person who commits a tort is called as a tort fees. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. It's also yeah. called a defendant. Okay. He's also called as a defendant in a case. Correct. Mm -hmm. When a case is filed, he becomes a defendant. For example, if a case is filed against me, if you file a case against me, say for any law of tort, under any tort, so I become the defendant and you become the plaintiff. But suppose I have just wronged you. That means I just become a tort feaser. After you file a case against me, I become a defendant or I become the respondent. I respond to your petition in the court. So that's how. So when a case is filed, the person is called, when a, after the case is filed, the person who's filing the case is called as a plaintiff or who files the case is the aggrieved party, the one who is wronged, against whom it is filed, it is filed against a tort feaser. And when it's filed against a tort feaser, he becomes, he becomes a defendant or a respondent, okay? Now, having seen the perspective now, in today's class, we are going to study the thought of negligence. We all know that being civilized and being part of a civilized society, we ought to conduct ourselves in a particular manner we have to confine ourselves to the laws of the land. We have to confine ourselves to, or rather subject ourselves to morality, good conscience. We are to behave wisely and we are to behave prudently as a person of normal prudence, rational thinking, normal prudence. Prudence means wisdom or something which is done prudently uh, where a person thinks wisely, thinks prudently, where a man or a woman of normal prudence, how would a man or a woman 
or of normal prudence would behave. We are expected to behave in that manner. We are not to be careless. A simple example, we walk in a particular way. We talk in a particular way. We don't talk carelessly to the extent that we hurt somebody, somebody just like that. We don't talk in a way that would insult someone. Or we do not talk about someone in a way that, you know, behind their back in a way that it would tarnish or affect the reputation of a person. We walk in a particular manner in a way that we do not harm any person or property around us. So all these in simple terms are part of civilized living. And if you remember in jurisprudence, we learned in the, in a, in the different class of jurisprudence, we learned how laws were developed and how laws uh, you know, really evolved over all the years and how, if you go through Thomas Aquinas theory, how from where the laws were borrowed and how the society really developed. So today we have laws where we are bound by it. And now we are studying the law of thought, which is a civil wrong. And under civil cases, under the law of thoughts, a person, when a person is wronged, then a person who is wronged is entitled to claim compensation for the wrong or injury that is inflicted upon him. That means he is entitled to compensation. That means the person who wrongs him is liable to pay that compensation as the court directs the person. Now, in the law of thought, or just in law, this compensation, or in terms of money, whatever you, the court decides that it evaluates a matter and says, okay, you wrong this person, so the damage that is caused to a person is so-and-so amount. So that particular amount is called as damages. It may interest you to note that that particular amount is called damages are you understanding me the spelling is the same damage you just add an s to it it's called damages so if a person causes a damage to you you are entitled to damages the court adjudicates the matter and awards damages damages can be in the form of compensation for the loss that a person has really uh, you know has incurred or whatever damage may be caused note here i'm not using the word damages i'm eliminating the s there i'm repeating i said that for the damage caused to you you are entitled to damages so this term damages in law means compensation that is awarded by the court and there are different kind of damages uh, in the law of thought damages are called there are two types of damages broad classification there are several types of damages but just for the purpose of our discussion for this moment there are basically two types of damages liquidated liquidated l-i-q-u-i-d-a-t-e-d liquidated damages and unliquidated damages i'm reiterating liquidated damages and two unliquidated damages. What is liquidated damages? The liquidated damages are damages where both the parties, say for example in a contract, example in a contract, say that okay in case of any breach, any breach of contract or if someone goes against any clause of a contract or any term in simple terms against any terms or of understanding in a contract, the party has to pay, you know, damages, and it will be say, ABC amount, whatever ABC amount. So that is liquidated damages where the parties decide amongst themselves, okay, so they, they basically, you know, have an understanding between themselves saying that the person whoever wrongs has to pay X amount of money, or ABC amount of money. So this is liquidated damages. What is unliquidated damages? It's quite contrast. Unliquidated damages are damages which are awarded by the court. That means 
it is the courts that decide or calculate the actual damage that is caused. So that is called unliquidated damages, where parties are not aware of what kind of damage it is, but it is for the courts to assess the damage, to calculate the damage. So that is unliquidated damages. Likewise, there are pecuniary damages. Pecuniary, it is actually it comes from the word, I mean, it normally implies pecuniary. The word or the term pecuniary implies something related to finances or something related to money. Pecuniary damages, that means it is normally in the forms of fines that are normally issued. So there is also something called as pecuniary damages. There is nominal damages, that is kind of a fair damage, the damages that is paid and so on. Okay, so now having seen the perspective and given you certain, um, you know, introducing you to certain key terms, now let us go through our slides and go through in detail the thought of negligence. Wow. One minute. Okay. Okay. So the thought of negligence. Now, what is the thought of negligence? As even we said earlier, we said the thought of negligence, which is a civil realm, is a most common thought which normally floods the court. The thought of negligence floods the court. I gave you an example of a real case last time saying that there was a doctor while he was performing surgery, he forgot a sponge in the, in the abdomen of a patient. So she was entitled to damages and he was liable under the law of thoughts to pay damages. And apart from that, of course, they will, there are other, uh, he's exposed to you know, other legal formalities and other, he has to face other legal rigors in terms of his profession and so on. That's a different, totally a different factor. But under the law of neg uh, thought of negligence, he was uh, liable to pay damages to his patient because he forgot because of the medical negligence involved there and he forgot during the surgery <clears throat> sponge in her abdomen. So the thought of negligence is the most common thought. Negligence simply means displaying a careless attitude which you already know and what we are concerned here in this thought of negligence is that as a result of that carelessness there is a wrong that is inflicted on another person. Now, as we know, thought means a civil realm. So in this chapter, we are going to delve into the aspect of thought as a result of negligence. And as a result of negligence itself, it is considered as a thought. So example, reckless driving or rash and negligent driving. Now, in the legal sense, what is the definition of negligence or how does the law look at negligence? Negligence is just more than a careless attitude, rightly as a Lord Wright defined negligence. He said that it is more than headless or careless conduct, whether in commission or omission, it properly connotes the complex concept of duty, breach, and damage. I want you to remember these three terms. He said that it is a complex concept. It involves or it connotes the complex concept, one of duty, of breach, and damage, thereby suffered by the person to whom the duty was owed. What is trying to clearly tell you here is, for a negligence to be proved, there has to be a duty on the part of the other person to conduct himself in a normal manner as a man of normal prudence. He, is, he has a duty not to be careless. Now, when he has a duty of not to be careless, he has breached that duty. He has trespassed the duty. And as a result, damage has been caused to someone else. There is injury that is inflicted on someone else. Now, for the injury that is caused or damage that is caused, 
the person who is injured or the aggrieved party there, they're called as the aggrieved party. The aggrieved party there is entitled to damages. Now, the legal dictionary defines negligence as a conduct that falls below the standard of behavior established by law for the protection of others against unreasonable risk of harm. It further explains that a person has acted negligently if he or she has departed from the conduct expected of a reasonably prudent person acting under similar circumstances. So therefore negligence occurs when one fails to take reasonable care. So this is an important keyword for you. When one fails to take reasonable care to avoid causing harm or damage to another person. So let's consider now a hypothetical case as an example and help us that will help us to understand the thought of negligence. Say, for example, there's a guy named Adam and Adam has engaged in thoughtless and rash driving and consequently he hits a car driven by Steve and Steve injures his limbs. And Steve is now hospitalized for two months. Now the question to you is, can Steve sue Adam for damages? So prima facie, the answer is in the affirmative. That means yes, he is entitled to damages. So Steve was injured as a result of Adam's driving. And so generally speaking, Steve should be able to sue him. Now, of course, apart from that, considering the court normally would not just take the matter as it comes, they would normally investigate. They will elicit evidence. Evidence will have to be produced and they will check various factors. They will see whether all the elements of thought is or the thought of negligence is there, and then they would draw a conclusion whether at all the person is entitled to damages. But prima facie speaking, yes, Steve, since he was injured as a result of Adam's reckless driving, so generally speaking, Steve should be able to sue him under the law of thought. So in such a situation, in order to prove negligence and claim damages, a claimant must prove several elements to the court, such as duty to take care, element of carelessness, etc. So now let us examine a classic case law to understand it further. Now, this is very, very important case. It is a significant case. Donahu versus Stevenson. You will have to give me the entire citation. Citation by citation, I mean, Donahu versus Stevenson, 1932 in brackets, UKHL 100. You'll have to give me this entire stuff. Donahu versus Stevenson, 1932. UKHL, that means it is actually handled by the House of Lords in those days. Now we have the Supreme Court as a highest court in UK, but once upon a time there was this House of Lords. So it was a matter that was decided by the House of Lords and below them there were the Privy Council and so on. So the structure of the courts were different. There was Privy Council and so on. But this matter was actually, the final, finally it was decided by the highest court then Somewhere in 1932, it was the House of Lords. So you'll have to say the Naha versus Stevenson, 1932, UK HL 100. This is a landmark judicial precedent. When we want to say that a case is a very important case and which has formed the basis of law, we call it as a landmark judicial precedent or a classic judicial precedent. And just to remind you a little bit of jurisprudence also that we learned, we said that judicial proceedings also form the source of law. They also are a source of law. And much of the, the, you know, the English common law system is a judge-made law. Are you understanding me? So this is, in that area, a landmark, one of the important cases that went to develop the concept of, uh, you know, negligence. Uh, or the thought of negligence. The Nahu versus Stevens in 1932, this is a landmark judicial precedent. It was delivered by the House of Lords in English thought law. It laid the foundation of the modern law of negligence in common jurisdictions worldwide. For example, in India, even in India, we use this case and uh, we refer to the you know, common laws because in, in India it is a common law jurisdiction. So in jurisprudence, we learned there are different jurisdictions. We have civil law, juris, uh, civil law jurisdiction. We said we have the religious law jurisdiction. And we said we have common law jurisdiction. So Donahue versus Stevenson for the law of tort. 
it formed, you know, uh, really, um, uh, it played a very pivotal role in, uh, you know, developing the law of negligence, which case, the Donahue versus Stephen case, and it helped in establishing the element of duty of care. Donahue versus Stevenson, I'm reiterating so that it goes into your mind so that never in life you forget this as a law student, because, you know, you should be able to tell it even in the sleep. So this is such kind of a case that never ever in life as a law student, you should ever forget this case, the Nahu versus Stevenson, because it is a landmark decision and it formed the basic con the concept of duty of care, which is an important element for the tort of negligence to be proved. Now let's go to the interesting facts of the case. There was a lady called the Nahu. She went out with her friend. She went to a cafe in Glasgow, Scotland. Donahu's friend actually ordered drink for her. Uh, it was a ginger beer. And actually, it was ginger beer and, and ice cream, which is not mentioned here. So they ordered a ginger beer, and the friend paid for the beer. So Donahu drank some of the contents of the ginger beer. And a friend, in fact, she attempted to pour the remainder of the ginger beer into the glass or a tumbler or a cup or whatever they want, they want to call it. It was then that they observed a snail, a snail, and the remains of the decomposed snail was in the bottle of the ginger beer, of, of the tumbler, sorry, of the ginger beer, which was there in the tumbler. So Donahu, she had already consumed some part of it. So Donahu, subsequently, she got sick. And because she got sick, she said, now, let me sue the cafe for the negligence, because they're not supposed to serve me such kind of ginger beer. And the cafe, he argued, the cafe owner, they contended, that is, they argued that the cafe purchased the product from a distributor and therefore the cafe is not liable for the harm caused. Now, the distributor, he contended that, well, they purchased it from the bottling, the, the main company which manufactured the ginger beer, that is, Stevenson. So they said that, how are we to know about the snail and the ginger beer bottle? Because the ginger beer bottle was also opaque. It was not a transparent bottle. It was an opaque bottle. It was not a see-through bottle. So they said that, well, we are also not to be held responsible or liable for this because it was not we who manufactured that. Let the manufacturer be responsible for the ginger beer. And so it was Stevenson. And then Stevenson now, he denied saying that, Will we add snails into the bottle? I mean, it's something unthinkable. So he said, he denied of having snails in any of his bottle. And he argued that Donahu's health problem, she probably she has her own health issues. And Donahu's health problems has been caused by her own bad health condition. So as we are discussing the case, I want your mind to keep thinking about this. Now, now, Stevenson, the main manufacturer, he also contended that the facts were not proved and that he said that, well, we have not caused Donahu any harm and we have no intention of causing any harm to Donahu. And therefore, Stevenson said he's not liable to pay any damages for the damage that is caused to this lady, Donahu. Uh, just a reminder, just in case we get cut off, please join back. Then the trial court accepted the plea and the defense of Stevenson and dismissed Donahue's case. What did the court do? The trial court, that is at the lowest level, the trial court, the trial court accepted the plea of Donahue and the defense of Stevenson and dismissed Donahue's case. They said, Donahue, you're not entitled to any compensation because Stevenson is right. Then Donahu appealed. She went in appeal. You appeal from the lower court's judgment to the higher court. Donahu then appealed to the House of Lords. And finally, her claim was successful. Now, Donahu's lawyer, he argued that Stevenson owed, listen carefully, Stevenson owed a duty of care. So this is a key phrase here a duty of care. 
So the Nahus Council or lawyer argued that Stevenson owed a duty of care, the manufacturer of the ginger beer owed a duty of care. And that was independent of a contract and Stevenson owed a duty of care since the ginger beer was meant for human consumption. Because what Stevenson argued was, well, we did not have any contract with, personal contract with, uh, you know, with the Nahus. So when there is no contract existing, so why should we pay the amount to her? But the council said independent of whether or not there is a contract is not the matter of concern here. The matter of concern here is that Stevenson owed a duty of care since he was a manufacturer of ginger beer and he owed a duty of care to anyone and everyone who consumes a ginger beer because it is meant for human consumption. Then Stevenson's council argued now that it was an established law in England then and even in Scotland that no duty was owed by manufacturers to anybody with whom they had no direct contract. So that was a law that had, that when there is no direct contract with the person, so they are not liable to pay any amount to them or any compensation. Now the House of Lords hearing was held by five bench team. I'm sure you know that lawyers are called as a group of lawyers or lawyers as a whole, as a community, they are called as the bar, B-A-R, and judges are called as the bench. So collectively, when you talk about judges, you say it is a bench. So there were five judges uh, adjudicating the case or deciding the case in the House of Lords. There were five bench team, including Lord Macmillan. There were other lords, other judges as well, including Lord Macmillan and Lord Atkin. Now, this person, Lord Atkin, he was the one who tried to substantiate and build the concept of duty of care. And he said, well, no, duty of care is actually thrust upon every person in the world. And he came up with a test called as a neighbor test. So let's read further. The House of Lords through Justice Atkin, this is very important for you to know, fashioned a very interesting principle and adjudicated the matter, that is, he you know, decided the matter based on this principle that he came up with. And he called this principle as the neighbor test. Now, the Nahu versus Stevenson and neighbor test, you will have to know, have to know, and have to know throughout your life. In the Nahu versus Stevenson, there was a test that was laid down that is a neighbor test. And this neighbor test was laid down by Justice or Lord Atkin. Now, what is this test? This test was rooted in the Christian doctrinal edict of doing good to the neighbor. So the question was, in this case, who is your neighbor? And in what way did the House of Lord, Lords adjudicate? How did they decide the matter? Now here, the plaintiff had to establish that the defendant owed her a duty of care. Now, this lady, Donahu, had to prove now that the defendant, Stevenson, owed her a duty of care. It is his duty not to be careless towards her. But he is saying that I don't have any contract with you. I don't even know who you are. So, but she said, no, you owe a duty of care to anyone and everyone who consumes the ginger beer, which is manufactured and bottled by you. Justice Atkin was kind of leaning towards, uh, you know, the Nahu. Uh, and, you know, he said that, well, through Justice Atkin, he fashioned this interesting principle uh, called as a neighbor test, which was rooted, of course, in the Christian documents. It's a reputation here. Yeah? So the plaintiff had to establish, of course, the dependent order of duty. And then this duty of care was established by applying the neighbor test set out in Donahue versus Stevenson. Now, what is this neighbor test? It implies that it was reasonably foreseeable to the alleged wrongdoer, Stevenson, that his particular conduct or omission would be likely to cause harm to the person who has suffered damages. So what is this neighbor test? Neighbor test, basically, Justice Atkins said that it is something, an act or omission, that can be reasonably foreseen, you can see it in the future, that when there is an act or an omission, there would be a harm that is likely to be caused to another person. So he should be able to foresee the harm because of his act or omission, whatever it is. And that harm to the extent that there is someone who would suffer damages. Now, who is this someone? They said that there is not really a direct connection. There is a remote connection 
a very long-rooted connection. It's not direct connection. There's no direct nexus between Donald and Stevenson. So they said, how come you will become my neighbor? Yeah, my neighbor. So now let's see what the Justice Atkin said, Lord Atkin said. Justice or Lord Atkin, he opined that there is a Christian moral rule that requires one to love their neighbor. And this manifests, he said, that means it is also has to be seen in the law as a rule that one has to be careful and not to inflict injury to his neighbor. He further opined that the duty of care is one of exercising reasonable care, reasonable care, what is reasonable care is one which any person of normal prudence, normal thinking would exhibit. So to the extent that in order one's neighbor is not subject to danger or an injury that is foreseeable. So he defined a neighbor. Now he says, now who is a neighbor? He defined a neighbor as one who will be directly affected by one's action or omission. So House of Lords therefore held in favor of Donahue, albeit not unanimous. That means not all the Lords there, not all the judges really agreed with him, but of course majority were with him. And when he said that, who is a neighbor is anyone who will be directly affected by you. It's not necessarily my neighbor, it's just the next door neighbor, not just my even my classmate who sits beside me on the bench, but the neighbor can be anyone and everyone, even a stranger, where when we are walking on the road or we are driving across the street, it can be anyone to whom we may cause some harm due to our negligence. So therefore, we're expected to exercise the duty of care and conduct ourselves carefully. So Stevenson was therefore made liable to compensate and pay damages to the Nahu. So this case is a landmark case, is a classic case which established that regardless of the absence of a direct contractual relationship or a direct nexus, direct relationship, contractual relationship between parties, a duty of care can arise. It could arise at any time. So whether or not there is a direct relationship with the party, so therefore, the landmark principle of the law was established in Donahue's case, that is duty of care. And then they added it in the law of thoughts and said, yes, when there is negligence, we'll have to check whether there, a person owed a duty of care to the neighbor. A neighbor is anyone to whom you owe a duty, anyone around you. So it's owed to a person who will be affected by one's action, and such a person is a neighbor. <clears throat> And then the neighbor, this neighbor, <coughs> excuse me, this neighbor is entitled to sue for damages in case there is an injury, where he suffers an injury. So this is regardless of the absence or the presence of a contractual relationship. So before we go further, I'd want you to, you know, watch a video and hopefully this doesn't get disconnected. And in case we get disconnected, please join back. So we are here on the slide, on the 10th slide. Before that, I'll just stop this. I'll just uh, stop this slide and I'll try to share the, the video. <clears throat> 